Welcome to 2022, everybody. Great to be back. And there is so much to talk about. It's an election year. The election is getting going. It's not going to take very long that I can assure you. We have some good news to kick the year off with, including specifically that radical Republican um, uh, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene has been banned permanently from Twitter. We will get to that a little bit later in the day. But we have to start with some words of caution. And we have now uh, heard from three military uh, retired military generals who are sounding the alarm and saying in 2024, it's not just a Republican coup that you have to worry about. You have to worry about a military coup. One of the reasons that Trump's coup attempt didn't work was that he's very incompetent, of course, and he did not have the military on his side. Now, there's no shortage of support for Trump in the military, but he didn't have the generals on his side. And what these three retired generals are pointing to is the possibility that that could be different in 2024. It doesn't necessarily have to be Trump, could be a different Republican. And they are now saying uh, you got to be careful about this. Very good NPR article. Retired general warns the U.S. military could lead a coup after the 2024 election. And it says as the anniversary uh, anniversary of the insurrection at the Capitol approaches, three retired generals are warning that another insurrection could occur after the 2024 presidential election and the military could instigate it. The generals, Paul Eaton, Antonio Taguba and Stephen Anderson made their case in a Washington Post op ed quote. In short, we are chilled to our bones at the thought of a coup succeeding next time. Um, they have these are highlights from a conversation you can listen to, and I encourage you to do so. How could a coup play out in 2024? The real question is, does everybody understand who the duly elected president is? If that is not a clear cut understanding that can infect the rank and file or at any level in the U.S. military. And we saw it when 124 retired generals and admirals signed a letter contesting the 2020 election. We're concerned about that. We're interested in seeing mitigating measures applied to make sure the military is better prepared. This is a crucial point. We lucked out in a sense that Trump and his cronies were too incompetent and poorly organized to pull it off. And in addition, if it ever got to the point of actually getting the military involved, the officer class and the generals in the military weren't going for it. But there was this letter signed by retired generals and high ranking military officials that said, we don't believe the results. What happens if you see that within the power structures, structures of the military? Is it likely? No. I mean, even they say, you know, when they're asked, how, how worried are you on a scale from one to ten? I see it as low probability, high impact. I hesitate to put a number on it, but we need to be prepared for it. In the military, we do a lot of war gaming to ferret out what might happen. You might have heard of the transition integrity project that occurred about six months before the last election. We had four scenarios. And what we did not play is a U.S. military compromised. So we advocate that that particular scenario be addressed in a future war game held well in advance of 2024. And that is a very good idea. The military has a ton of extremism in it. There are self study projects done. Uh, we've talked about some of them about extremism and radicalization in the military. There's a whole bunch of it right now. It is not common uh, prevalent among the top brass. It could change and imagine if it did. We know that there are these boogaloo and proud boy types in uniform talking openly about their involvement in the January 6th riots. It appears as though they're going to be punished. Let, let's hope that that happens. There were members of the military that participated as individuals on January 6th. And we know that this is a sort of feedback loop. Um, when I've gotten emails from members of the military who say, David, sir, uh, on base, there's one news channel that's ever on TV, and that channel is Fox News. Um, and so when we you know, over the last two months, I have been making a more concerted effort to say this isn't just ha ha. Look at these morons. 
in terms of the January 6th stuff, in terms of the it was stolen by Joe Biden stuff. It's yes, cartoonishly unhinged. And the world looks at it and says, how could these idiots believe this stuff? How what what has failed education, media, society? And the answer is yes, all of the above. Of course, it all has failed. But that doesn't mean we can just laugh it off. And I've been taking it significantly more seriously over the last couple of months. And this uh, uh, these interviews from these three retired generals should make all of us say we can't just write this off as kooks who could never get further than they got in 2020. They could get further. And one of the biggest components that would make that a plausible possibility would be the military actually really being on their side. So we're going to continue talking about it worth listening to the interview or at minimum uh, reading the article from NPR. We'll link to it in the description for the YouTube clip uh, for this story. Folks, the right has a new meme. I don't know if mass formation psychosis is completely killing. Let's go, Brandon. But it is spreading rapidly on the virus front. We have Omicron rapidly outcompeting Delta on the memetic front. Right wing memes. Uh, we quickly have mass formation psychosis overwhelming. Let's go, Brandon. They can probably coexist. What am what am I talking about? Mass formation psychosis. Let me set this up for you. Uh, there's this guy called Robert Malone. Uh, Robert Malone is someone who has for a period of time now been credited with and taken credit for developing mRNA vaccine technology. Now, this is a claim that has been fact checked quite a bit. It's a bit of an exaggeration. What the right wingers want you to believe is that Robert Malone is the guy who created mRNA vaccination and now he's totally against it and thinks it's terrible and dangerous and wants to destroy the monster he created and all this different stuff. OK, a more sober analysis and you can just Google a number of different very good stories about this is that he was one of many people over a long period of time who did research that contributed to the development of the technology, which, of course, eventually can get applied to one thing or another. And now a couple of the current covid vaccines are based on the mRNA. OK, you get the idea, right? So so that's part number one. The second part is Robert Malone has now been uh, banned from Twitter for spreading covid disinformation. And this is, of course, bringing out all of the that's fascism and communism and authoritarianism and its violation of free speech and all these different. So it's bringing out those people. It's also bringing out the people who are of the mindset of the, the truth trademark. The truth about covid vaccines and covid itself is being suppressed. It's being covered up, et cetera, et cetera. So Robert Malone got himself an appearance on an emergency podcast with Joe Rogan. And in it, he I don't know that he coined the term, but he kind of made a portmanteau of two terms that exist. And that term is mass formation psychosis. He is saying that this mob psychosis plagues um, the side of science when it comes to covid. And what is incredible, I'm going to th this clip has gone giga viral millions upon millions of views. When you listen to what he's saying, it sounds like he's explaining what is plaguing the American right wing, the covid deniers, the vaccine conspiracists, the Trumpers, the stop the stealers. But he's not talking about that. Let's just get right into the clip and then we're going to talk about it. Listen really closely from basically European intellectual inquiry into what the heck happened in Germany in the 20s and 30s. You know, very intelligent, highly educated population, and they went barking mad. Um, and how did that happen? Um, the answer is mass formation psychosis. When you have a society that has become decoupled from each other 
and has free-floating anxiety and a sense that things don't make sense. We can't understand it. And then their attention gets focused by a leader or a series of events. Guys, he's describing Trumpism. What we have, I mean, it's, do, I almost feel like I, I'm over, it's, it's too on the nose. Like, I, I feel like if I give any explanation, I'm over explaining. It sounds like he's describing the mass psychosis of Trumpism that I've been talking about for years, but he's not. He's talking about people who accept the vaccine science on one small point, just like hypnosis. They literally become hypnotized and can be led anywhere. And yeah, and 70 something million of them ended up voting for Trump. One of the th aspects of that phenomena is the people that they identify as their leaders, the ones typically that come in and say, you have this pain and I can solve it for you. I and I alone. Guys, he's quoting Trump. He, he's quoting Trump. Here is here is Trump literally saying I alone can fix it. I alone can fix it. I, I will restore law and order to our country. Do you guys remember that? It he's quoting Trump verbatim, but we're supposed to believe it's the you know, I don't want to call it the left because there's Republicans that accept science and then Paris. It, I've never seen anything like this. Okay, can fix this problem for you. Okay, then they will lead. They will follow that person through. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether they lie to him or whatever. That's exactly what happened with Trump. He lied to them about all of it. I mean, it's it, how does uh, it th now? They're they're all on this now. All the right wingers are now. Yeah, Dr. Robert Malone explained what's going on with these leftists. This mass formation. The data are irrelevant. And furthermore, anybody who questions that narrative right. is to be immediately attacked. They are right. the other. <clears throat> this is Ooh. central to mass formation psychosis. And this is what has happened. We had all those conditions. If you remember back before 2019, everybody was complaining, the world doesn't make sense, blah, blah, blah. Um, and we're all isolated from each other. We're all on our little tools. We're not connected socially anymore, except through social media. There's something about these types of typically it's it's guys where they talk in a certain way. I mean, where they they do what they're accusing that when he talks about hypnosis, what you when you listen to the way that Brett Weinstein has spoken about vaccines, he goes, well, the um, it's a uh, spike protein is cytotoxic. And I, I'm concerned that. Listen, they have a way of talking. And Ben Shapiro has it, too, although it's a different way, very different way of talking where it almost doesn't matter what they say. Now, what the, the now they're all talking about mass formation psychosis. What is that? Um, There's a combination. The term mass formation psychology is a pre-existing term, and it just means like crowd or mob psychology. And they're just saying he's adding psychosis to it to say, well, it's a form of psychosis. It's a mass it's a mob psychosis of sorts. Um, what is incredible about this is that we, we have to share this because this is the best description I've ever heard of the MAGA movement, except he's not applying it to that. When I listen to it, I'm thinking, wow, what a what a perfect analysis of what has plagued this country with the MAGA movement for years now. But he's not talking about that. Like the the unaware lack of awareness about the irony is incredible. Now, just because you come up with a name for something doesn't mean it accurately describes anything. And the truth is, I've been describing what's going on since covid in this way for a long time. You know, back in January of last year, 2021, I did a segment called the shared psychosis of Trumpism. I mean, I, I literally described this, except he's he's describing it, but not actually talking about Trumpism. In May of last year, I did a segment called 54 percent of Republicans think Trump riots were led by violent left wing protesters, where I described this as a group psychosis. That, that's verbatim the word that I used. So it's not a new concept and it couldn't be more of an instance of projection. But this is their new meme. Robert Malone is their new hero. And the new meme is mass formation psychosis. And they lack the ability or awareness to realize it applies to them better than to anybody else they might point the finger at. Send me your thoughts. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at D Curious to hear from you.
Remember that even in 2022, the David Pakman Show continues to be sponsored primarily by viewers and listeners through the David Pakman Show membership program. I invite you to sh- sign up uh, at uh, joinpacman.com. You can use the coupon code WOW22. That's, and you have to say it that way WOW22. All one word, all lowercase, and you will get a discount that is uh, this type of thing. They might outlaw this if depending on who wins in November, they may outlaw this type of discount. Sign up at joinpacman.com. OK, am I ready to tell you how insane the U.S. covid numbers are? No. Why not? Well, we don't have the full numbers from the last few days because of the New Year's holiday. I can tell you that the numbers have gone nuclear or nuclear to quote certain people. OK, you know, former President Bush, uh, but we don't yet have the full numbers, but it's looking like real infections, real because a lot of people don't test at all or, you know, all that stuff. We may be talking one point five uh, to one point eight million covid infections a day in the U.S. U.S. OK, real number. We will get to that. The question about this insanely transmissible Omicron variant is what will it do and for how long in terms of hospitalization and death? Although if it's this contagious, the total burden on society is going to go up because it's so contagious. You're still going to get hospitalizations. You're still going to get deaths. If it is dramatically less deadly as a percentage of cases of infections, it could very quickly accelerate our progress to the end of the pandemic phase, which will just go to the endemic phase. One place we are looking at very closely is South Africa, because South Africa was we don't say it was the place it came from, but it was one of the earliest uh, countries to be very open about the data of the number of people infected, et cetera. We now have news from South Africa. South Africa says it has passed its fourth wave of cases, meaning they believe that Omicron is essentially done or ending in South Africa, and it counts very few added deaths. Now, if you're saying, but David, a lot of things are different here. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. New York Times, the South African government said Thursday data suggests the country has passed its Omicron peak without a major spike in deaths, offering cautious hope to other countries grappling with the variant. Some scientists were quick to forecast the pattern elsewhere. So let's look at the numbers that we had Um, now. As you can see, if you're watching, you you can see this massive case spike. I mean, going from about 300 cases a day to 23,000 cases a day. Okay, that's that's almost uh, uh, you know, a 200 X increase at 150 or something like that increase in cases. But their cases are now down something like what's that 16 over 24 down about 66 percent. But deaths had a very modest spike. We don't not care about these deaths. They're still tragic. But when you see that cases went up, what, 150 to 200 times and deaths went up from about 30 a day to like 60 a day, you say that that's pretty notable. That's pretty notable. Now, why might it be different in the United States or in other countries? There's a bunch of different reasons. First of all, uh, during earlier waves, South Africa had very low levels of vaccination, meaning that earlier waves sort of burned through the population, large parts of the population. Um, The beta variant, which was not huge outside of South Africa, went through there. That may provide more um, sort of a population protection to these are questions. It may remember that Delta different lineage than Omicron, not believed to provide not believed to provide significant protection against Omicron. Omicron is based on an earlier lineage. It's split earlier, so to speak. It's theorized that the beta variant having burned through South Africa might make Omicron particularly less severe in South Africa. And we might not have that. We don't have that. And it may be notable in the United States. That's number one. So we have to wait and see. Number two, the South African population is much younger than the United States. Five percent of South Africa's population is 65 plus. 
16 percent of the U.S. population is 65 plus. That's very different. So if we have to guess right now, there's these two competing stories. It'll be insanely bad in the United States or it'll be just like South Africa. The more, most likely scenario based on what we have now, because lower rate of hospitalization is being observed in a lot of different places, is that it will be worse in the U.S. than in South Africa, but it won't be nearly as bad on a on the case rate basis as earlier waves were. Uh, the other thing that's sort of important to remember is in the U.K., even the rising hospitalization numbers, a ton of the people hospitalized with covid are not hospitalized because of covid. When you test everyone who is in the hospital and you have something so contagious that could be 40 percent asymptomatic, you're going to find tons of people who have it and are in the hospital for something else. They still count. So my view here is still cautious optimism. And we're going to continue looking at the numbers. Uh, we have a kind of nice way to start 2022 in a very particular sense amongst a lot of bad news. And that's that radical right lunatic Republican Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene has been permanently banned from Twitter for continuing to spread covid disinformation. Now, there are people acting like we'll get to the people saying this is fascism. It's very funny. We'll get to that. People acting like this was on a whim with no forethought or basis. This was her fifth strike. Uh, there's an article in The New York Times. Twitter permanently suspends Marjorie Taylor Greene's account. Social media service says she violated its covid misinformation policy. Um, Twitter suspended her account after she tweeted on Saturday falsely about, quote, extremely high amounts of covid vaccine deaths. She included a misleading chart that pulled information from a government data database of unverified raw data called VAERS, a decade old system that relies on self reported cases from patients and healthcare providers. Twitter said Ms. Green had a fifth strike, which meant her account will not be restored. The company had issued her a fourth strike in August when she falsely posted vaccines were failing. She had a third strike a month before that when she treated COVID was not dangerous and vaccines should not be mandated. Her official congressional account, Rep MTG, remains active because tweets from that account didn't violate the services rule. So just to go through it element by element, I'm showing people the Rep MTG account. That one has about 400,000 followers. She has not posted there since December 24th, where she posted a Christmas message of some kind. Um, I'll just play a few seconds of it and I will warn you, Listening to her speak is extremely triggering in a lot of different ways. On behalf of myself, my family and staff, Perhaps. I want to wish all Americans and especially those in the 14th district. Of okay, the I, I already I mean, OK, we're, we're done with that. Um, there are some people reacting to this in ways that uh, don't don't really make a lot of sense to me. Um, a lot of people are calling this. So so there's a but I don't even know where to start. First, there's people criticizing and saying that we need regulation. Twitter shouldn't be allowed to do this. Um, why can't businesses have terms of service that they enforce? And and that I mean, that's just what it is. Uh, there's a lot of confusion from people who generally say businesses should be allowed to do whatever they want as long as it's not illegal and very few things should be illegal who are saying businesses shouldn't be allowed to require vaccines. Well, hold on. Can they require that you wear a shirt? Yeah. Can they require that you wear shoes? Yeah. If you don't like it, can you choose just not to go there? Yeah. But they can't do vaccines. OK, doesn't make sense. That's one hypocrisy. But then the other one is they are saying there should be something that the government does to prevent these businesses from deciding for themselves what they want to do as long as it's not illegal. Now, there's another aspect of this, which is people saying this is authoritarian fascism. Former guest Brian Class, he's been on a couple of times and he was on a few months ago. He had a really great perspective on this, which you can find on Twitter. And he wrote, whenever Twitter suspends someone for spreading deadly lies, someone will call it authoritarianism or fascism. It's the opposite. It's a free market company 
making decisions without government interference or directives. Fascism is the inverse. Fascism is extreme state control. And Brian goes on to say there are complicated free speech issues around social media, which we all I mean, anybody who's thoughtful agrees with that. But I can assure you, says Brian, that Twitter couldn't make its own choices to ban government officials somewhere like North Korea. They would instantly be shut down. We don't have fascism here because Twitter can do this. And at least for now, the government isn't saying you got to allow Marjorie Taylor Greene to lie about vaccines or Trump to do whatever. So let's be consistent. Is it illegal to do what Twitter is doing? It is not. Well, then, by their definition, if it's not illegal, it's OK. And people can choose to boycott. Uh, there's many of you might remember or know or you know whatever that the David Pakman show started in the uh, city I grew up in, Northampton, Massachusetts. And I still have a lot of friends in Northampton. And recently there was a hearing held by the Northampton Board of Health about businesses requiring vaccines, more and more businesses. You know, I hear from friends, this business, that business is requiring vaccines. I have friends who own businesses in Northampton. They say we're going to require vaccines of customers. And they had this this hearing via Zoom and you know, people could comment on Facebook and, and elsewhere. And you have all these people making conflicting and different arguments. It's like you uh, about this is the worst decision ever. This is this is authoritarianism. This is Nazi. This is fascism. This is all these different things. Break it down element by element. Is it illegal for a business to uh, require proof of vaccines? I don't even care about does it do anything? I've said at this point, this thing is so contagious that the vaccines primarily are protecting people from serious illness, hospitalization and death. It's still it, the cat is out of the bag. This thing is clearly going to burn its, its way through whether there's a vaccine requirement at a local restaurant or not. But is it illegal to require vaccines? No. OK. So now we're just in the realm of opinion. You don't like businesses that require vaccination, then don't go to them. It, it's really that simple. Marjorie Taylor Greene knew what the rules were at this point. She chose to break them. It's her fault. She should be banned. That's it. Officials don't get a special allowance to spread disinformation about a public health crisis because they're elected officials. She was elected by Georgia Trumpists to represent them. It doesn't mean that you get a national platform or global platform to tell lies that violate the policy of Twitter. Is Twitter discriminating against people on the basis of race when they do these things? No. Are they discriminating on the basis of national origin? No. If you don't like it, you don't have to use Twitter. That it, it, that, that's fundamentally what it is. And this really does matter. And what I mean by that is when Trump was banned from Twitter, uh, Mango Mussolini, the tangerine terror. You guys remember the guy. The amount in general of hate speech went down. The amount of people weren't then reamplifying the stuff Trump was, was putting out there. So this works and it's legal. If you don't like it, that's a different story. And if you want to propose regulation of Twitter of some kind, I'm glad to discuss it. But then we have to be able to say we should be regulating all regulating all sorts of different businesses that right wingers always say, let them do whatever they want, as long as it's not illegal as of right now. I want to hear from you guys. Um, we'll post uh, uh, more about this on our Instagram. You can find us there at David Pakman show. So we're continuing our uh, discovery, for lack of a better term, of who did what, who knew what, who tried what in the lead up to the November of 2020 election, in the period between the November election and the January 6th riots, and then after the January 6th riots to try to cover up what was done, tried, said and attempted during that previous period of time. And a lot of the stuff we're learning, we're learning thanks to the work of this House Select Committee investigating the January 6th riots. In the next segment, uh, we're going to have some uh, incredible revelations from Republic Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney. But before we get to that, we are now getting a list of documents from the House committee. We don't yet or won't have all of the content of each of these uh, documents. But what we know so far is, I mean, chilling and disturbing is probably an understatement. Listen to this chilling Trump letter calling for seizure of election material revealed 
in log to January 6th probers. The letter was created a day before Trump discussed naming conspiracy theorist Sidney Powell special counsel to probe baseless election fraud claims. The document in question, and you can find this is there's a PDF and I'm putting it up on the screen. You can find this. This is publicly available. Mixed in with a whole bunch of other documents, which may or may not be interesting to you. There is an item called draft POTUS letter, meaning a draft letter from Trump. Uh, and it says it is described as draft letter from POTUS to seize evidence in the interest of national security for the 2020 elections. Now, there are a few interpretations of what this could be, and they're all absolutely terrifying. Let's go back to this Huffington Post article, which, which outlines a bunch of it. The log, along with a trove of documents, was provided last week. They were handed over by Trump ally Bernie Carrick, former NYPD uh, commissioner and confidant of uh, Rudy Giuliani. Carrick was a key advisor to Trump's legal team trying to cook up a narrative of fraud in the presidential election that Joe Biden won. Besides the documents Carrick turned over, he also offered a log of documents he refused to provide, including the Trump letter. Among the documents withheld is one described as draft letter from POTUS to seize evidence in the interest of national security in the 2020 election. Though Trump ultimately didn't take action to seize election materials, such a letter could be a key piece of information in the investigation into Trump's strategy to undermine a legitimate election. Authorities have found no evidence of fraud. The letter was created December 18th. That's the day before he met with uh, General Flynn and others to try to figure out what to do. Trump also discussed naming far right attorney conspiracy theorist Sidney Powell a special counsel. He ultimately didn't do that. Flynn had already suggested Trump could invoke martial law to seize control of the election. Remember, this is the guy who wanted to review voter registrations nationally, right? That, that's one idea Trump floated. I believe it was in advance of the midterms. Um, this is not someone who considers sacred uh, information related to people's uh, uh, actual voting and what it means sees information is not even exactly clear, but it's extraordinarily authoritarian. You know, we, we talked earlier, all of these right wingers say when Twitter banned Marjorie Taylor Greene for covid disinformation, when Twitter banned Dr. Robert Malone for covid disinformation, that's authoritarian fascism. No, it's not. It's a private business enforcing terms of service in a completely legal way. On the other hand, when a sitting president drafts a letter saying let's seize election materials, which could be uh, mail in ballots, it could be voting machines, it could be all sorts of different things. Let's seize it and try to use it to steal the election, which was, of course, the goal that in and of itself deserves an investigation. That is the authoritarian nightmare that these right wingers say Twitter is actually doing. When we now understand the context of all of this, which was trying to do an insurrectious coup, what exactly did Trump and his legal team plan on doing with the voting data? Um, even the guy Trump put in charge. Remember that whole committee that but you might have forgotten about it because it found nothing. But they, I think it was called the Voter Integrity Commission or committee or something. He put that guy, uh, Chris Kobach, the Kansas secretary of state in charge of it. Um, it. It found nothing. Even he wasn't willing to seize the voter information back during that period or wasn't willing, maybe just realized it, it wouldn't work. Right. Um, and as I was reading all of this over the weekend, I don't know how many of you saw the recent film Don't Look Up with Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence and a bunch of other actors. It feels much more like a documentary than satire. The more we read about what this administration was doing uh, towards uh, towards the very end, the uh, honestly, the the most. I, I've, so there may be a spoiler here. There may be a spoiler. There may, may be a spoiler about the, the, the film Don't Look Up. The most unrealistic part of Don't Look Up was that some people actually changed their minds once they saw the comet with their own eyes. Trumpists would have claimed even looking at the comet, you can't believe that you can only believe what Trump says, 
It must be a Soros founded projection that looks like a comment meant to scare us into accepting government control or whatever. I mean, that's how weaponized this disinformation has become. And as we learn about all of the things they almost tried, uh, it makes it even more urgent that we put in safeguards so that they can't even get this going in uh, 2024. And we've talked about that earlier. We're, we're going to talk about it again. Uh, Two hundred and six Marines have been discharged for refusing the covid vaccine. Now, you might say, wait, but David, don't they get the hep A vaccine and the hep B vaccine and the flu vaccine and the MMR vaccine and the meningococcal vaccine and the polio virus vaccine and the tetanus diphtheria vaccine and the varicella vaccine. And depending on where they're deployed, the anthrax vaccine and the hemophilus influenza type B vaccine and the Japanese encephalitis vaccine and the pneumococcal vaccine and the rabies, smallpox, typhoid, yellow. Fe OK. All right. Yes, they do. But this is different. This is about their rights. All right. So the bottom line is every time we hear they're going to lose a third of the service, NYPD one third are saying 34 New York Police Department officers actually discharged, actually discharged. And so when I read more than 200 Marines removed for defying covid mandate, I think this seems like a good thing. What I mean by that is. When we found out at the end of the day, 34 NYPD officers were removed for not getting the vaccine. I don't know that those are the good apples that we actually want in, in NYPD anyway. Uh, and much the same way, if these are the 206 that are being removed, there's something like 18,000 Marines or something. No, I'm sorry, 180,000 Marines. This represents 0.11 percent of them. I think this is fine. These don't sound like team player Marines report from Axios. U.S. Marine Corps said it removed 206 service members for refusing the vaccine. Updated numbers come as DOD has ramped up repercussions for those defying the vaccine order. The branch said it had already discharged 103. The big picture, approximately 94 percent of active members are fully vaccinated. As of last week, roughly 98 percent of all active duty forces, including reserves, have received the vaccine. Remember that Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin in August said all troops must get the vaccine, encourage service leaders to set up their own timelines to date. Approximately thirty two hundred forty seven requests for religious accommodation over the vaccine have been made. Zero have been approved, according to a Marine Corps communication officer. One note about that. Um, this doesn't mean everyone else is vaccinated. Some of those requests although they haven't been approved for an exemption, they may still be in process. So that's where you get. That's why we're still short of 100 percent. There are people who have made a request for an exemption. It has not yet been adjudicated or even if it has, it has not yet led to a discharge. And so that's all going to have to sort of be be sorted out. Service members can request to opt out of mandatory um, uh, health elements um, on the base of vaccination on the basis of a health situation, an administrative reason. I, I don't know exactly what would count as that or a religious exemption. Um, those can be temporarily granted or permanently granted so far from what we're seeing. None of them have been granted for Marines. Uh, I read a comment and I, I don't I don't know. I mean, this is it's just a comment from one member of the US Navy that there are service members who are looking for a way out and that refusing a vaccine is a way to get an honorable discharge, maybe benefits, maybe benefits, although we're we're hearing conflicting things about benefits um, and that this is a way for some people who were looking to leave anyway to do it while saving face. That's one opinion from one member of the U.S. Navy who wrote to me. Take it for what it is, which is which is simply an anecdote. But the the big takeaway continues to be the legality of these requirements is not in question. The morality can be argued. The effectiveness is also not in question. These work. And, you know, United Airlines was a big one where much hubbub was made and like everybody got vaccinated other than I think it was 200 people or something like that. So these requirements do work. 
there's a fair debate to be had about in the context of Omicron, where there is only some protection, some protection from two doses against getting an, a, a symptomatic infection. What is really the goal here? Well, the primary goal seems to be to keep the burden on hospitals down by preventing people from ending up hospitalized. But these next four weeks are going to be wild. The numbers are insane that we are seeing. And maybe by tomorrow, maybe by Wednesday, we'll have kind of like the full catch caught up numbers from the holiday. Uh, and then we'll see how things are looking at that point. All right. I teased this earlier. Let's uh, let's get right to it. There is now um, a statement that has been made by Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney, who's on the House Select Committee Committee investigating the January 6 riots. She says they have firsthand testimony that Ivanka Trump, among others, but Ivanka Trump, the president, the former president's own daughter, um, asked Donald Trump, please do something to stop these riots on January 6th. And of course, he did not. And this continues to kind of flesh out the picture that we are building uh, about exactly who did what and when on that day, what were the goals, what were the intentions, what were the priorities of different people. And this is just unbelievable. Liz Cheney, we have firsthand testimony. Ivanka asked Trump to stop the January 6th Capitol riot. Uh, the House Select Committee investigating the riots has received firsthand testimony that Trump's daughter Ivanka twice asked him to intervene. Trump was watching the riot unfold on TV while sitting in the dining room next to the Oval Office at the time. Let's go right into the clips. This is Liz Cheney appearing yesterday with George Stephanopoulos on ABC. It is uh, it's everything we imagined, guys. Is his failure to make that statement criminal negligence? You know, uh, I think that, that there are a number of, as the chairman said, uh, potential criminal statutes uh, at issue here. Mm. Uh, but I think that, that there's absolutely no question that it was a dereliction of duty. Uh, and, and I think one of the things the committee needs to look at as we're looking at a legislative purpose is whether we need enhanced penalties for that kind of dereliction of duty. Now, I want to be real. There's a reason she's saying this, and this goes back to what, what we talked about uh, last week. Officially, a congressional committee's main purpose can't be to figure out if someone committed a crime. And Trump has tried to stop the investigation by saying they're primarily just looking to see if I committed a crime. Liz Cheney is saying exactly what she has to say. Now, whether it's true, or maybe they are primarily looking at whether Trump committed a crime, but at least what has to be said is our interest is as lawmakers, are there laws we need to pass to prevent this from happening again? If we happen to come across crimes that were committed in so figuring that out, then we can refer those crimes. There's a if you saw that segment last week, you understand the legal re relevance of that. But let's continue. Uh, but but I think it's also important for the American people to understand how dangerous Donald Trump was. Uh, we know as he was sitting there in the dining room next to the Oval Office, uh, members of his staff were pleading with him to go on television to tell people to stop. We know Leader McCarthy uh, was pleading with him to do that. We know members of his family. We know his wow. daughter. We have firsthand testimony uh, that his daughter Ivanka uh, went in at least twice uh, to ask him to please stop this violence. Uh, any man who would not do so, any man who would provoke a violent assault on the Capitol to stop the counting of electoral votes, any man who would watch television as police officers were being beaten, uh, as as his supporters were invading the capital of the United States, is clearly unfit for future office, uh, clearly can never be anywhere near the Oval Office uh, ever again. So this was a very interesting and wide ranging interview. Let, let's go to another segment here where the topic is, again, at any point, Trump could have put a stop to this any point, And he did not. And we're joined now by the vice chair of the committee, Congresswoman Liz Cheney. Congresswoman Cheney, thank you for joining us again this morning. Happy New Year you too, to you. you. Now, you were alarmed by this from the very start, from the moments, the first moments on January 6th when this started to unfold. You've cut a lonely path in your party. Have you been surprised by anything you found over the last year? Well, I've certainly been surprised by many things. Uh, I think that in uh, the piece that you played uh, by John Carl just a few moments ago, uh, he touched on the fact uh, that, that we know now, we are learning much more about what 
uh, former President Trump was doing while the violent assault was underway. The committee has firsthand testimony now that he was sitting in the dining room next to the Oval Office watching the attack on television uh, as, as the assault on the Capitol occurred. Uh, we know, uh, as you, you know well, uh, that the briefing room at the White House is just a mere few steps from the Oval Office. The President could have at any moment walked those very few steps into the briefing room, gone on live television, and told his supporters who were assaulting the Capitol to stop. He could have told them to stand down. He could have told them to go home. Uh, and he failed to do so. Uh, it's hard to imagine a more significant and more serious dereliction of duty. It's funny to say he failed because it. Does, I mean, he didn't. He chose not to do it. Failed almost in, suggests he wasn't able, but he he chose not to. And uh, two thirds of the country and a lot of the world asked the exact same questions Liz Cheney is asking here, which is why why not do it? And um, one last segment here. And again, this is this is Liz Cheney. She's she's all power to her. She's saying we have to be loyal here to the country, not to Trump. And this isn't good for the Republican Party. Liz Cheney is a right wing Republican with whom I disagree on just about everything. She voted with Trump something like 93 percent of the time. But on this particular issue, she is correct. You're about as stalwart Republican as I've ever met. You come from a long line of Republicans as well. Of course, your father served uh, in the White House. Your mother served in, in administrations as well. How do you explain, given your belief, your views and your background, why a majority of Republicans today would reelect Donald Trump? Look, I, I think that um, we're in a situation as a nation where uh, I certainly have very strong disagreements with the policies of the Biden administration. I think that, that the policies that Vice President, President Biden has adopted uh, are the wrong ones for this country. I think we need conservative principled leadership. But the Republican Party has to make a choice. We can either be loyal to our Constitution or loyal to Donald Trump, but we cannot be both. And the nation needs a Republican Party that is based on substance and values and principles. Uh, and, and we've got to get back to that if we want to get this nation back on track. But fundamentally, at the end of the day, we, we can't be a party that's based on lies. We've got to be based on a foundation of truth uh, and, and fidelity to the rule of law. So listen, she, she's saying all the right things and I applaud her for it. I do. This is still not someone who's going to be one of our political allies. But would we be better off if more Republicans saw Trumpism and their party and country really as three different things and that you can be on the side of one or two of those without having to stand by Donald Trump. Of course, we would be better off. Of course, we would be better off. So there is Liz Cheney, Ivanka, Ivanka, firsthand testimony that Ivanka multiple times tried to get Trump to do something uh, and Trump didn't until hours later said in a video, it's time to go home. We love you. We know why you're here. It was stolen, but it's time to go home. A completely Pathetic, pathetic, almost non reaction to the horrors of January 6th. And Trump will be doing a press conference on uh, Thursday, January 6th, the anniversary of the riots, making some kind of statement. We don't know what that will be, but we can be almost certain it's going to be completely whacked out. The Ron DeSantis story just keeps getting more and more insane. Let me re reset this for you. Uh, the last time, up until recently, that Ron DeSantis, the uh, Republican, tr very Trumpy in Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis was seen in public was December 17th. On December 17th, he showed up at Bagelicious Deli and Bakery in, o in Ocala and he took a picture. This is from the Bagelicious Deli and Bakery page on Facebook uh, dated December 17th. They posted even the governor loves Bagelicious. So this was the last time he was seen in public and nearly two weeks went by, nearly two weeks went by. And then all of a sudden the DeSantis people came out and said, oh, he was with his wife at her cancer treatment. Ron DeSantis, wife is being treated for breast cancer. And our thoughts, of course, are, are with her. And we hope that the treatment goes well. Uh, but that is the explanation for why he was missing for two weeks. Didn't really make sense because apparently that was only on December 29th that he was with her. It then got even weirder because on December 30th, the Ron DeSantis official Twitter account posted the very same picture of DeSantis at the Bagelicious as if it was that day. Had some great bagels from Bagelicious in Ocala. Stop by if you're in the area. So. 
understand that it's very weird. This is the last public picture of DeSantis anywhere. We know the picture is from December 17th because Bagelicious posted it on December 17th. And then on the 30th, after tons of people saying, where is this guy? COVID is exploding. It's complete and total chaos. He's MIA. He says, no, look here, I'm out in public. But they post a picture that is 13, almost 14 days old. OK, so that's all really, really weird. But then this is just the worst part of it. And this is this is just sad. I don't know how else to say it. This is just sad. Um, there is now video of Ron DeSantis at a huge concert on New Year's Eve. With his wife, who has cancer, unmasked. Um, everybody should assess risk for themselves. Of course, uh, you know, it's your wife has cancer. We have an insanely contagious variant. Florida is setting case records every single day and you go to a massive event without masks. I mean, what are you what what are you doing that this is dangerous to her? Take a look at this. And so in Florida, you can mark it down. We will not let anyone shut you down. Yeah. And we are going to make sure that our rights are respected. And that's what we've done. And that's what we'll continue to do. So I hope you all have a very, very good 2022. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of good things on the horizon. And uh, we're looking forward to being able to do a lot for the state. Looking forward for my wife to beat breast cancer, which is going to happen. And so thank you. and. Keep fighting. All right. So you get it. I mean, listen, we all hope that she beats breast cancer, bringing her in the middle of peak covid unmasked to a huge event where we have a prevalence where by by some estimates, 12 to 18 percent of the country currently has covid um, seems incredibly unwise, but just a very strange story missing for almost two weeks says, well, I'm missing because I was with my wife at cancer treatment, except when you look, that was only on the 29th posts a picture from two weeks earlier saying, hey, here I am in public. And then you show up unmasked at this. Everything about this guy disgusts me. And that certainly doesn't change with this latest episode. Uh, we have a voicemail number. That number is two one nine two David P. Here's a really instructive question from a viewer. Take a look at this. Yeah, David, you describe yourself as a left winger. Right. But it seems like you're a pretty big supporter of capitalism. <laughs> How do you reconcile that? Yeah. Well, listen, th this this goes to some significant confusion. Um, most left wingers are not socialists. This is just it's an empirical reality. Uh, most many left wingers like me support socialization of some elements of society and the economy. I want to take health care outside of the capitalist system. I want to take education outside of that. There are arguments for with some aspects of housing, but not all taking it outside of just supply and demand and markets. But most left wingers are not actually socialists, even in countries like my birth country of Argentina with big socialist traditions. Most of the left wingers are not actually socialists. So there's no conflict. I'm a social Democrat in the style of some blend of northern European countries, I support a much, much more regulated and controlled version of capitalism whose main priority is let's use the fruits of that regulated capitalism to set a much higher floor for everybody, for the betterment of all. Let's also set some kind of ceiling above which we really are collecting a lot of taxes for the betterment of society. It's called social democracy, but I don't need uh, uh, I'm fine with markets dictating resource allocation for consumer electronics, vehicles, products of different kinds. I, I'm OK with that. I think it's OK. I think if you build something um, and it's a company and it's yours and you built it, I don't think that should be taken away from you. However, we recognize that you built it based on utility infrastructure established by the government and through tra taxation protection for intellectual property established by the government 
presumably with employees, many of whom went to public schools, which is paid for by through tax. Right. When we recognize, well, yeah, you 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 organized the structure and you built it. And so you do deserve many of the fruits of that labor. It was also built on the backs of all sorts of government infrastructure and tax dollars, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why we have to cycle back a portion of it into the betterment of society. That's fundamentally social democracy. It is a left wing perspective. I would argue it's the most successful, most successful version of progressive ideology globally over the last 150 years. OK, so that's my perspective. Uh, we've got a great bonus show for you today. Uh, absolutely insane travel chaos. And it's not just Omicron causing it. We will talk about Hillary Clinton's interesting 2024 prediction. We'll talk about how on earth do schools reopen with Omicron spreading so wildly uh, and much more. All of those stories on today's bonus show. Sign up at joinpacman.com and you can use the coupon code WOW22. And when you type it in, you have to you have to say WOW22. It saves you big. You get access to the bonus show. You join the ranks of membership for what will be a really important election year. I'll see you then.